everybody. We are doing things differently today, as you could tell by the fact that six of us will be preaching the sermon. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. So uh, we are, uh, we're going to be doing two sermons uh, this week and next week that are a little different than what we're used to. We're going to be preaching on church membership. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons that we're going to be doing that, but one is because of what's happening in the life of our church as we move through the spring. If you come to family meeting tonight, you'll hear more about that. Uh, but the reason that I'm down here, there's two reasons. Number one is because I have a whiteboard with me, and if you've been to Sunday school, uh, you know I like the whiteboard. And, and the real reason for that is because um, if I don't write it, it's going to take me two hours to get through it. So we're going to write it, okay? And then we'll all get home at a reasonable hour. We're going to do two sermons this week and next, just talking about church membership. I want to start with three sentences that I'm going to write up here that are extremely important for all the rest of what we're going to be talking about today, okay? Statement number one, the Bible is 100% true, amen? All right, so we're tracking so far. Everything in the Bible is truth, and everything that it affirms, we must affirm, okay? Number two, the Bible is the boss. Now, if you've been around for a little while, you've heard me say this before. What I mean by that is that if the Bible tells us that we should do something, then we should do it, right? Seems like a pretty obvious thing. Hang on, because it's going to get a little sticky, okay? That's number two. Number three is that if we come to the Bible and we see something that must change, then we change, not The Bible. You guys understand? We are the one changed, not the Bible. We change, not the Bible. Now, the reason that this is so important is because church membership has a very cultural idea to it that is less than biblical at best and unbiblical at worst in many cases. That's the bad news. Now, I'm going to prove my statement. So the question, so I wanted to start actually with a question. If I were to ask you what the Bible taught about church membership, what would you say? You don't have to answer, okay? Sunday school is very interactive. You guys are totally welcome to be interactive, but it is not necessary. So if I were to ask you, what did the Bible teach about church membership? First question is, what would you say? If you have an answer, then my second question would be, where is that in the Bible? And most of us have in the back of our minds an idea that church membership is probably a thing that we should do. We have in our minds the fact that church membership is a thing that should happen. The problem comes in actually believing what the Bible says about it because we have some folks uh, who have various different opinions on this. One group would believe that church membership is completely unnecessary, that it's not a thing that we have to do, and you don't have to, that, that, that it's not even important to be part of a church at all. Our community is full of people that will say things like, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, or I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. Those statements imply something very different than, I'm getting ready, than what I'm getting ready to teach you about what the Bible says. Okay? Others believe that church membership is kind of like being a member of, a, of the YMCA or a social club. It gives you some benefits when you need them, and it can serve to have some of your needs met, but it really doesn't require anything of you other than maybe the occasional membership fee that we just collected. All right? Some believe the church is a voluntary organization. So it's a force for good in the community that you can be a part of if you want to, but you don't really have to be in it if you don't want to. Some have no idea what church membership is or means. In fact, as I was writing this sermon, it occurred to me, as I thought through the time that I've been walking with the Lord, I don't think I've ever heard anybody actually preach a sermon about church membership. And yet I've been in lots of places, and I bet you have too, where it was expected that you would understand what is expected of you. Well, that's just totally unfair. So what if we just spend some time talking about what the Bible says about what a church member should be? Because the Bible gives us several key passages that help us gain valuable insight into what a church member is and how we as a church should treat church membership. So we're going to do two parts of this sermon. Part one will be this week. Part two will be next week. Those are my clever titles. Church membership part one, church membership part two. All right, so this week I want us to start just by getting an understanding of what the Bible says about what a church member is, okay? Now, you just got a handout that is two things. Number one is it's an outline. That's to keep me accountable. 
You're welcome to read along. Number two is a list of Bible verses because this is another common thing I hear, and maybe you've heard it too. The Bible doesn't say anything about church membership. Okay. Let's read a few. This is not a complete list, by the way. This is just a list. I found over 96 different passages in the New Testament that refer somehow or the other to church membership, but that would have taken us a lot longer. So we're going to stick with this list. I'm just going to read these out loud because we like to read the Bible at the beginning. Okay? I don't want anything I say to not be motivated by what I believe the Bible teaches and what I want you to believe the Bible teaches. So we're just going to read these verses and pray, and then we're going to dig in because we're going to try to get everything from a big picture and see what all this is saying together. Okay? So 1 Peter 2, 9, but you, which is plural, remember I say often that the Bible, it's unfortunate that it was not translated by Southerners, because if it was translated by Southerners, we'd understand it better, because almost everywhere where the Bible says you, it's actually saying what? Y'all, right? And, and so once you begin to understand that right off the bat, there's a lot of y'alls in here, okay? There's a lot of y'all out there, there's a lot of y'alls in here. So, but y'all are a chosen priesthood, a royal nation a people for his own possession that you may, y'all may, proclaim the excellencies of him who called y'all out of the darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 5, you, yourselves, all y'all. All right, so that's more than two, right? So you got y'all and then all y'all. Now we've gone to the all y'alls. All y'all, like living stones, are being built up to be a spiritual house. And then he goes on to talk about how we are representatives of Christ. Same verse, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, through Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, we, all of us, are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Fourth thing, the church is a, a local outpost. It's important to note each letter. I'm going to say this in just a moment. Each letter in the New Testament, except for personal letters to Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, were either written to a personal local church or to a group of local churches in a region. And Timothy and Titus were both pastors of churches, and Philemon was a member of a Church, all right, you guys picking up what I'm putting down? Body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, for just as the body is one, Steve just read this, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body. But that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Look at Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. That's right. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is speaking to the elders of the Ephesian church, and he says this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Matthew chapter 16. We'll spend more time on this one next week. Or actually, we'll spend time on Matthew 18. So Peter has confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says this, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, that confession that you are the Christ, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. 
And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Those keys were given to the church. All right? Some more verses. We're going to read these through the, through the course of our time together today. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for y'all. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Paul is writing to a church. Hebrews 10, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 34. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to them was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold. They're describing a church. Philippians 2, let each of you, y'all, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul is writing to a church. All right, so let's pray, and then we'll start unpacking together. Father, we thank you that you have made your word clear, and we pray that you would help us to discern what is true and good, and then apply those things to our lives so that we might change because of the unchanging nature of your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to tackle was the statement that says the Bible doesn't talk about church membership. Can we go ahead and assume that we've already tackled that, all right? We can go through, and we'll go through these, all right? But what I want to do is really there's three big questions that I want us to evaluate about the whole concept of church membership, all right? Question number one, what does it mean? That's where we got to start. What does it mean? And I want to start by actually breaking that down into two questions. Question A, question one. What is the church? You know, so I, as many of you know, I, I am bivocational. I work a, a job other than having the joy of being a pastor. I also serve the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And one of the things I get to do is help young men who are hoping to plant a church or replant a church um, with looking at kind of how to train them and get them ready and then send them out so they can do the work. And I have found that the single most helpful question I can ask these guys is a question that in many cases, up until the point they've come and talked to me, no one has ever asked them. And it's this, what is the church? Seems like a simple question. What is the church? The body of believers, that's right. I think what we see as we move through these things is there are several metaphors, illustrations, that are used. And I want us to think about what that means in two ideas. When we think about a body, a body consists of two things, more than two things, but follow me, flesh and bone. You guys get me? If you just have a big bag of flesh, you don't really have a great looking body, all right? If you just have skeleton, you have skeleton, but you don't have an actual body, all right? When the Bible talks about church membership, it talks about it using two different ideas, flesh and bone. When you think of flesh, all right, these are the things that we normally really like about the church. These are things that we like about church membership. These are the things that we like to receive from others in terms of church membership. So it's a body. Each one of us gets to use our gifts. We'll talk about that in a second, all right? It's the bride of Christ. There should be something that's just amazing to us about the fact that we are married to Jesus and that he's always going to follow through on his commitments, all right? Body bride. We've got branch. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the, the branches. All right, so you've got those three. You've got flock. Jesus calls us his flock, implying that each one of us is sheep. Never a great idea for a sheep to live in the wild by himself. The implication was that sheep should live among other sheep because they don't have sharp teeth. Any major way to defend themselves. They need a shepherd. All right, Jesus is the shepherd. Pastors and leaders of the church serve as under-shepherds, answering to the shepherd. 
All right, and then family. These are some, and most of the ones that are used most often, and each of these implies something about the church. Okay, you guys follow me? Those are the flesh things. Those are the things that we like. You know, there's this body, bride, branch. I'm, I'm a part of something. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a piece of something. But then there's also the bone part of this thing, all right? And there's two that we hear. One of these we sang about just a second ago, sort of. We sang the song Cornerstone, all right? Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but we are called the temple of the living God. Temple is a, a building. There's a structural aspect of it, all right? We're part of a big building. And then nation. We are a kingdom, and we serve a king, and his name is Jesus, answerable to the king and representative of the king. So we are both of these things, okay? So the church is both of these together. It is flesh and it is bone. One of the ways that, that, that was helpful for me to think about it this week is I drink a lot of coffee. If you know me, you know this is true. I've had more than one cup this morning. And so when you drink coffee, right, we like the contents of the cup. But do you know what happens if I don't have the cup? I don't get the coffee in the right places, right? My coffee has a, has a destination. It has to make it to my mouth and down my throat. In order for that to be the case, I have to have something to give it shape. You guys follow me? That shape most often in my life is a coffee cup. So if you think of this in the same sort of ways, this is the coffee, this is the cup. I need both of them to be able to accomplish it. Do you get, you get my feeling? You've got to have structure, right? You have to have substance. Structure without substance is legalism. Substance without structure is, is anarchy. It's just, it's just feeling. Everything's based on how you feel, not based on what is true. Do you guys follow me? You've got to have both aspects of this to get a real picture for what the church is. So if we're going to boil it down in a definition, I like to draw pictures while I do definitions. So here's what I'm going to say the church is, all right? Church is a living nation, all right? We are alive, made alive, of adopted sinners. The living nation of adopted sinners, and I'm going to draw both lines together because we are united, made one in whom? Christ. We're made one in Christ, okay? That's a, that's a good starting point, but that's not sufficient. It's not complete. We're called to do something. We're not just called to exist. A living nation of adopted sinners, united in Christ, and I'm going to draw an arrow because it's action. It's what we do. We're called to do two things, serve and care for, if you guys can't read my handwriting, that's fine. This is really for me. It's on your sheet. It should be the definition that I'm working through. All right. Called to serve and care for one another. Okay. As we show the world who Jesus is. Show the world who Jesus is. So the purpose of the church is to show the world who Jesus is. How do we do that? By being and caring for one another. How can we serve and care for one another? Well, we're united in Christ. We've been adopted by his, by his blood. We've been made into a living nation. You guys follow me? This is what the church is. The church is a living nation of adopted sinners, united in Christ, and called to serve and care for one another as we show the world who Jesus is. That's super long, right? That's why I wrote it down. But there is a, there's, there's so many aspects to this. It's not just a thing that you do. It's not just a place that you go. It's a thing that you are. There's a substance to it. You are the church. That's why we're really careful here about the way we refer to things. We may call this the church building. Do you know what we won't call this? The church. Do you know why? Because this is a place where the church is housed, but it itself is not the house. Who's the house? Raise your hand if you are the house of God. Yes. Right. And vocabulary matters. You know why? Because the non-believing world is listening. If the non-believing world hears us call this building a church, then what are they going to think the church is? Right, because they're smart. And so this is what the church is, living nation, adopted sinners, united in Christ, called to serve and care for one another as we show the world who Jesus is. Let's latch on to this one. We're going to show the world who Jesus is. Now, if that's the, the first question, then the second question after that is, well, that's great. What is a church member? And that's what we're really trying to accomplish today. But we had to start with what a church was, 
so that we can go to what a church member is. What then is a church member? Well, you can take the same things that we just used, flesh, all right, body, bride, uh, branch, flock, and family, and you can apply them to what a church member is. And you can also apply the bones. There's a temple, but we are a brick in the temple. A nation, and we are a citizen of that nation. In every part, in every time that the Bible refers to church membership, it talks about a person being a part of a whole. You guys follow me? So when we're the body of Christ, when the, when the passage in Corinthians is talking about members, it's talking about parts. Your finger is a member of your body. That does not mean that it paid dues. It does not mean that it's, it's, it's optional for it to be connected or associated with the body, right? Most of us who've ever stumped our toe on anything, can tell you that it does not feel optional for that pinky toe to be connected to the rest of your body when you hit a table. It does not feel optional. It feels painful. You know why? It's connected in a meaningful way. You guys follow me? So for sure, the church is a body, but each of us is a part. The church is the bride of Christ, right? Beautiful picture. Each one of us somehow is a part of that bride of Christ, and Christ is the head. Christ is the one who's, who's cleansed us and who will receive us. It's a part. We're a part of this. We are branches. He is the vine. From him we get our spiritual nourishment and growth and encouragement, but we don't get that in the Bible apart from the church. Right? We are, we're a part of the flock. We're each a little sheep. We got to have a shepherd. Right? We're not nearly as clever as we think we are, which totally exemplifies a sheep. We have sheep right behind our house, and they get stuck on stuff all the time, literally all the time. If they can fit their head, they just assume they can fit their body. And so off they go, stuck in massive tangles of kudzu. And now you got to, you know, guys come up and cut them out. Why? Because they're not as clever as they think they are. Neither are we. Right? That's why we need each other. Church is a family. Each one of us is a part, and we're part of a family. All right, so what is a church member? So we're going to think about what a church member is, and we're going to think about these things. There's also this part of it. All right, the church is, if the church is the temple, then you are a brick. I am a brick. If I came to your house today, and I walked in with a brick, and I said, have you guys seen my house? You would not look at the brick and think that I was talking about this is my house. You would think something happened to my house, right? I'm coming in with a brick saying, this is it. This is where I live. You can't live on a brick. I mean, some people can live on a brick, but that's not the best way to live, and that's not the way God wants us to live and function. Right? We're part of it. We are part of a nation. You think about the, the you know, Jesus, you know, when, when Peter is writing, and he says we are ambassadors, well, Paul says we're ambassadors for Christ. Peter says we're aliens and strangers. We're citizens somewhere, just not this one. Right? We sing this, this world is not my home. We just forget that sometimes, right? But the reality is the kingdom of God is not something we're just waiting for. It's something that we're part of now. You guys follow me? It's a now thing. It's not just a later thing. It's a now and a not yet. Now we're part of the kingdom of God. And the way the kingdom of God is made visible to the world is through the church. Right? So a church member is an adopted sinner. And this is the definition I've got down there. You guys can feel free to read it with me. A church member is an adopted sinner saved by grace, and joined to the family of God, responsible for the local church they have become a part of as they represent who Jesus is to the world. So the purpose of a church member is to show the world who Jesus is as part of a whole, as a piece of a whole body, as a part of a family. Now, the way that works itself out in our world, there's two ways to think, it, to think of the church. One is the universal church. We like this one. Okay? The universal church is every Christian who's ever been a Christian. Universal church. Everyone who's ever been saved is a part of the universal church. Okay, That one doesn't bother us because it doesn't offend us. We like the idea of being included and feeling like it costs or expects nothing of us. Here's the sticky part. 
The New Testament never just speaks of the church in universal terms. It speaks of the church in local terms. And the local church is the church, the body of believers that you have chosen, or if you're visiting here, are choosing to be a part of, to connect yourself to. Everywhere in the New Testament, when we see church, we see local. The book of Acts. When the, when the missionaries are sent out, for sure they're advancing the universal church, but they're called to start local churches. When Paul writes letters, he writes letters to local churches. When he's writing to Timothy and Titus, these guys are pastors of local churches. When he writes to Philemon, he's a member of a local church. When, when, when John is giving a picture for what it's going to be like when Jesus returns, the first two chapters of that book are dedicated to what? Churches, local churches, each one of them, local, each one of them, a specific problem addressed. So the whole New Testament is about the local church. So to say that the Bible does not mention church membership tells me that you may not necessarily, either you're not reading the Bible, or you may not be reading the Bible thinking about what God's trying to accomplish. What God's doing is building a kingdom. And he's building a kingdom through the church. Mark Dever says the church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. This is the means by which his will is going to be accomplished. Right? The church matters, and church membership matters. But now we got some definitions. The real question is why. Why does it matter? So, here's what I'm going to say as soon as I get the whiteboard. Why does this matter? Why would we preach on this on Sunday morning? Why would we spend time looking at it? And the answer, honestly, is because if you're thinking about this rightly, it will radically and can radically change your life and the way you think about the way you're spending your time, the way you're using your free time, the way you handle your resources, the way you prioritize your calendar. Because it really, it truly is the means by which God has decided to advance the kingdom in the world is the church, then where should you be investing a great deal of your time and energy? The church, right? So look at this. There are three things that we want to talk through here. Three words that I think, if these, these two definitions are true, that we've really got to evaluate. The first is responsible. If this is true, then there's a level of responsibility that each of us have. We are responsible for one another. There has been a long period of history where the church has often felt like the responsibility for caring for one another fell exclusively on the shoulders of the pastor. There's been a long period of history where pastors have really liked being the center of attention and the fountainhead of all responsibility in the church. Neither of those things are biblical. The church, Christians, are called to care for one another. Right? How? Number one is spiritual gifts. The number one way we're responsible for one another, spiritual gifts. If you come here, you decide this is a church that you want to be a member of, you have to go through a new member's class. And in that member's class, one of the things I will say is a, is a line that I stole from a good buddy of mine named Matt Rogers, and it's everyone has a gift to use and a mission to accomplish. Both of those things are done within the church. A gift to use and a mission to accomplish. In fact, When 1 Corinthians 12, which you've already read, talks about gifts, it's talking about using them where? In the church. You have your spiritual gift for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. Right? All of us, each of us, if you're called to teach, you may certainly teach, and you should teach in lots of different places. But one of those places that you should be using a great deal of your energy to teach is inside the church. If you are gifted in hospitality, You should have people in your house a lot. But a lot of those people should be part of your church. The purpose of gifts is to build the body of Christ. We have spiritual gifts, and we're responsible not just to use them, but to use them for the common good of the local church to which we belong. Here's what that means. It means if you are gifted, and if you're spiritually gifted, all I need you to do for me, do me a quick favor if you're a Christian, not a Christian, just take a deep breath in. Now breathe out. If you're here and you're a believer, you still have a gift to use, is you still have air in your lungs. If you have a gift to use, then you're responsible for stewarding it well. 
We talk about stewardship in terms of money. The Bible talks about stewardship in terms of life. We're called to steward all of the things we have been given. And the reality of it is not all of us have been given equal amounts of money. But if you're still here, you've been given time. And the way you use it matters. You've been given gifts. And the way you use them matters. We're called to use our gifts to build the church. The second thing that we're called to do, we're responsible for doing, is declaring. If the church is this body of adopted sinners, and if each individual Christian is a redeemed sinner, then what church membership is, is the body of believers looking at a person and saying, based on what we've seen in this person's life and the confession that they have made, we believe that this person is a Christian. That's the heavy part, right? Because the reality of it is, for many of us, there are a lot of people that claim membership that we don't even know. But do you understand that when a person claims membership to a church, they are saying that they are a Christian, and we are saying that they are a Christian. You guys understand the responsibility behind that? Now imagine for a moment someone you don't know living in a way that dishonors God. Is it their fault for sinning? Yes. Whose fault is it for not knowing them? It's ours. We're responsible. To, to declare that other members are pursuing righteousness. And we're going to talk more about this next week. Here's where it gets sticky. <clears throat> if you're listening here or you're listening on Facebook, this may be even more true. There's a real temptation at this point to say, you're judging people. You're not supposed to judge people. Judge not. Most misused and wrongly used passage in the entire Bible is judge not, lest you be judged. And nobody memorizes it in anything other than the King James. I guess because it sounds better. I you know, but really, that's, don't, don't judge me. What you, listen to 1 Corinthians 5. Here's what, okay, so we'll talk more about this next week, but here's the deal. Paul is addressing a real problem in the church at Corinth, like a real problem. Like there are bad things going on between in-laws, and it's gross, but he's addressing it. Okay? And he says this, listen to this. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? He's talking about people outside the church. Should we judge people outside the church? Nope, but listen to this. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge. That sounds very different, doesn't it? What's he saying? He's not saying we judge in a bad way. He's saying we should be fruit inspectors. Jesus said, a tree is told by its fruit. Good tree bears good fruit. Bad tree bears bad fruit, right? How do you know if a tree bears good fruit or bad fruit if you don't inspect it? If you go to Skytop in Hendersonville, in the fall, they would love nothing more than for you to pick, pick up every single rotten apple and put it in your bag and pay for it. But that's not what you're going to do, right? What are you going to do? You're going to pick an apple, you're going to look at it, you're going to make sure there's no worms, you're going to make sure there's no bad spots, and then you're going to put it in because they're expensive, right? Think of the Christian life that way. We're called to look at each other and speak the truth in love and to be gracious and to extend grace to speak with clarity because we are responsible for one another. You know, the thing that keeps me up at night as a pastor, as David's getting ready to be ordained to become a pastor at this church, is, is Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and pray for them as those who give watch and give account over your souls. That means I am responsible and accountable for every person who claims to be a member of this church. But here's the thing. So are you. We're in this together. Heavy, right? Serious. It's supposed to be. Responsible to declare. Third, to love and serve. Love and serve. All right, this is the more fun one. I got the, I got the hard one out of the way first, I hope. We're called to love and serve one another. All right, First Thessalonians 5, which is the passage that I already read. But listen to where it says, it says this, be at peace among yourselves. This is what we're called to do with one another. Admonish the idol. Like most idle people don't like to be admonished, but we're called to admonish the idle. It's the same passage, the same book. I think it's either First or Second Thessalonians, where, G, where Paul is writing, and he says, "If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat." Right? So encourage the idle, admonish the idle. Sorry, encourage the faint-hearted. You know, the role of the church is to find those who are faint-hearted and encourage them. To actually come alongside and put your arm around someone and say. I don't know how to encourage you, but I am here. And when you do that, you know what you find? You've been massively encouraging. The 
presence, ministry of presence is so much more important than having the right words. Nobody has the right words. We could be there, right? Encourage them. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. I have to read that one multiple times. I bet you do too. Be patient with them all. Be patient with them all. So think back a couple weeks ago, we preached about generational differences. What does the Bible say about our resentment of younger or older generations? Be with them. I think all means all. We're going to go with that. Okay? Be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. Seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Do you see what he's doing? Seek to do good to one another, church, and to everyone, including non-believers. you see what he did? He literally just said, church, world. So we're called to love and serve the church we have chosen to be a member of. Now, that's really important. One of the things we believe is that we do get the liberty within God's kind providences to choose the church that we're going to be a member of. But when we do, we are choosing to take on responsibility to love and serve those people. Some people are more lovable and servable than others. We're still called to love and serve one another. And all of this boils down to this. We are responsible as a church for the health of the church. A healthy church consists of healthy church members. Okay? A healthy church consists of healthy church members. Those church members believe the gospel rightly, believe that Jesus saves, but that salvation comes through repentance and then confession, turning from your sin, which implies change, and trusting in the Savior, submitting your lives to him, and trying to do what he has called us to do to be obedient. Healthy churches are made up of those people. You show me a church that is in decline, and I see a lot of them, nature of my second job. You show me a church that is in decline, and I will show you a membership that is weak, that is not healthy. There's something that needs to change. For sure, leadership in many cases needs to change. There's no question. A lot begins and ends with leadership. But that comes down to the church as a whole, wanting to be healthy. So, responsible. Second, called to. So, responsible or responsible? Oh, that's an R, not a C. We're called to one another. Called to. Called to one another. How? We, we typically use that word when we think about pastors being called to ministry. If God puts you here and you are a member of this church, or if you are listening on Facebook and you are a member of this church, you are called to this church. We're called to one another. To do what? Hebrews 10, which is a passage that we're probably famous with if you've spent much time in the, in the church at all, we're called to do, to number one, attend and meet. Number one, attend and meet. Now, I'm going to say a couple of things about this. If all you are doing is showing up for Sunday morning service, you are still not fulfilling Hebrews 10, 25. Right? So listen carefully. And let us consider how to Stir one another up to love and good works. And then he says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's not a box that you check off how many weeks you came so you get a little badge. It's the opportunity. I love, somebody said this on Wednesday night, and I'd love to say who it was, but I don't have permission because I didn't ask them. But they said this. They said, it's not that we have to go to church. It's that we get to go to church. You see how radically that changes the way you look at everything? Like, I promise you, I know I'm the, I'm the king of rebels. I, I have a rebellious streak nine miles wide in me, which means that if you just tell me I'm going to do something because I have to, you know what I'm not going to do? That thing. But when you start to tell me that God has freed me through the work of Christ and then called me to be a part of a gathered body of believers where I can then use my spiritual gifts, be cared for, and care, one another, care for one another, and then gather weekly to celebrate his holiness so that I get my, my encouragement from my brothers and sisters, I get fed by the word of God, and then I can meet with them regularly and call and follow up and spend time together. Okay, I'm in. I'm interested in that. That's the thing not only I want to do, here's what I know about my own soul. That's the thing I need to do. Meeting together is essential. In the same way that a fire is built of many individual little coals. I don't grill much with charcoal. I grill a lot with gas because I have a hard time keeping a fire lit on charcoal. The science to it, or an art, probably an art. 
I don't understand it. I'd rather just push the button. But here's what I do know. With charcoal, everything's got to be stacked up on top of each other. And they're all hot, right? If you touch any of them, what happens to your hand? You get burned. If I take a pair of tongs and I take one of those little pieces of charcoal off and I drop it down 10 feet to the left of that fire, what happens to it after about five minutes? The same thing happens to Christians when they do not meet together. And I don't care what the reason is. It will affect you. The calculated decision to not meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ that you are called to and responsible for will always lead to spiritual decline. That doesn't always mean that you can feel it or that you can experience it or that you see it, but somebody does. It will always lead to spiritual decline. So we're called to meet together because we're supposed to love each other. That's a thing we get to do, not a thing we have to do. Second, we're called to encourage godliness in one another. To encourage godliness. And this can happen through encouragement. Sometimes it happens through exhortation. We're called to encourage growth in Christ. The, uh, Doug, this morning, did awesome prayer time. It was on um, the Great Commission. We are all Southern Baptists, which means we know the Great Commission before we probably know how to walk which is go into all the world and what? Make disciples, not preach the gospel. I heard that for years. I heard go into all the world and preach the gospel. No, 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 no. That's not what he said. He said go into the world and make disciples, right? That's encouraging godliness in one another. If you're not making disciples and you're saying that you're a follower of Jesus, I just don't know what you mean. I don't know what that looks like. I don't think the Bible knows what that looks like either called to make disciples, right? We're called to encourage godliness. Third, we're called to care. We're called to care for needs. We've already hit on this one. We're called to care for one another, to care for the needs that we have. That's why I read that passage in Acts. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Think about Acts 4 for a minute. The full number of those who believed, first start with this, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. You see what he's saying? Every person who was in that room was of one heart and soul. What a great picture. Can the Holy Spirit do that? Yes, he can. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now, here's what this is about. Considering the needs of others as greater than the material possessions that you have. Considering people as greater than stuff. That's what this is about. With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any, need, as any had need. And the church cares for its people. We care for one another more than we care for the possessions that we have. And I would say that one of those, again, is time. We care for one another more than we care for the way we spend our personal free time on ourselves. That's a difficult one, isn't it? Here's what it comes down to. We are called to know each other and be known by one another. It's a dangerous thing, isn't it? It implies risk. Let me tell you something. Love always is risky. Always. Really love. Risky. You run the risk of being hurt. You run the risk of losing the rights to your life. You run the risk of somebody offending you. I know, because I have lived in the Christian world for longer than a couple of days, that the, that the American Christian church especially is full of people who say, I'm not going to trust those people because all those Christians just act like hypocrites and they're all horrible people. They are. Just all those things. You know, I don't necessarily buy into the fact that all Christians are hypocrites because the evidence of Christianity is not obedience, it's repentance. Right? That doesn't mean I'm not going to sin. It means when I sin, I repent. But we're called to know one another. I want to challenge you. If you're here this morning and you don't know somebody, there's an easy way to fix that. Get to know them. You walk up and say, hi, I'm, there you go. Get started. But you got to know each other. You got to be known. I heard it said often, and I praise God for it. That there will be Sundays where we'll come in and we won't know half the people in the church. You need to understand that that doesn't just imply the growth of the church. It implies a neglect of responsibility for you to get to know those people. That's what we do. We're all going to go, we're all part of the same kingdom. 
We all know one another, and we're known by one another. And then third, we're accountable. Responsible, called to, and accountable. I promise this is going to go faster. Hang on. We're accountable. Number one, to spur one another to faith and good works. Hebrews 10 says what? We're called to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let me ask you a question. How often this week have you really thought about the members of this church and how you could encourage one another? How many times have you thought specifically about a specific person in the church that might need encouragement and a way that you specifically could encourage that person? My, I'm going to venture to guess because I know my own soul. Most of us, including myself, chief of sinners, think more often about how other people could meet our needs than how we think about how we are called to meet the needs of other people, right? Because we all are inherently self-centered human beings. And so we think more often about how we can have our needs met than how we can meet the needs of others. But you know, the Bible does not speak about this reflexively. It doesn't speak about how you might be served by the church, does it? It talks about how you might serve, right? How do we know this? I mean, Jesus is getting ready to hang on a cross to infinitely and eternally serve his church. And yet, at the Last Supper, what does he do? He strips down, he gets a basin and a towel, and he washes the disciples' feet. Why? Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to that we do likewise. We spend more time thinking about how we can build relationships and how we can help meet needs. And you know a phenomenal thing happens. When you start doing that, you start finding your own needs met too. It's in many ways like marriage, which is why that illustration that Paul talks about is so important. If you come into marriage only ever thinking about what the other person ought to be doing for you, you are never going to get your needs met because the needs list is endless. Marriage is a call to self-forgetfulness where I forget about my own needs so that I might meet the needs of the person that I'm committed to. That's the church. We're called to think about one another. We're called to exhort one another to obedience. And ultimately, this comes back to Philippians 2, which is what we read earlier, to consider others as greater than ourselves. Listen to what Paul says. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. How many of the complaints that we have about the local church are totally silenced if we simply apply that one verse? To do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others as more significant than ourselves. All of a sudden, I find I have a whole lot less to complain about. And almost all of my complaints are centered around me and my own sinfulness, and my own selfishness. I've said it often. Criticism is not a spiritual gift. You do not have the gift of criticism. No one does. You might have the gift of self-criticism, and self-criticism is actually a part of spiritual growth. Looking inward to see ways that we could change and then applying those changes are an essential part to growing in Christ. So, this is all of the why. So let's get down to one more. So, what? All this is true. So what? How does any of this make a difference? Number one thing I want to say, we must see, if this is true, we must see regular involvement in a local church as biblical, healthy, and essential. We must see regular involvement in a local church as biblical, healthy, and essential. This is where it gets sticky, right? All of this is true, and I am claiming the name of Christ, and yet choosing to not be a part of a local body of believers, and I am simply making up what I think the Bible says. I am not applying what the Bible actually teaches. It is essential to be a part of a local church. Why? Because we need each other. Every illustration, go back to them, what are they all? We're part of a temple, we're part of a nation, we're part of a vine, we're, we're part of a body, we're part of the bride, we're part of a flock. You are part, but you are not the whole. Everything about the Christian life is supposed to be corporate together. It's essential, and it's healthy. Being a part of one another 
help me. You can be thinking often about all the things that are wrong with all of those other people that you don't want to be a part of. But here's the reality. There's a whole lot of things wrong with you too, and nobody figures it out if we don't do it together. We need one another. That's why there's so many one another's. Church involvement is regular, it's biblical, it's healthy, and it's essential. The regular and ordinary picture of the Bible for a Christian is for them to be a regular part of a local church. Second, we must take our responsibility seriously. Let's take our responsibility. We'll talk more about this next week. This is kind of part two. What are, our, what are the responsibilities of the local church members? We must take our responsibility seriously. This is what that means. That means that if you are choosing to not be an active part of a body of believers, you are choosing to neglect the responsibilities that God has given you to be a regular member of that local church. I don't know what else to call that other than sin. Because I don't think the Bible knows what else to call that other than sin. I don't say that lightly. I think one of the things that truly grieves the heart of God about the way that our churches are being conducted is that we can somehow take church membership flippantly. How we can somehow not see the responsibility that we have to every week encourage one another. That we can somehow not see the responsibility that God has blessed us with. It's not that he's just given it to us. It's not a box to check off. It's not supposed to feel like drudgery. I have the great opportunity to know that I don't have to go through this world alone. I am part of a kingdom that will never fall away, that will be ultimately established when Jesus returns. But right now, my responsibility is to show the world, this is who Jesus is. This is what his bride looks like. We are a bunch of messed up people. but We have the righteousness of Christ on us. And that means we can forgive one another. We can encourage one another. We can exhort one another. We can do all of that because what unifies us is the gospel. We must take that seriously. Here's the catch. If we're going to take that seriously, then that means we must change. This is going to have to happen on two levels. Number one is an individual thing. Right? That's you. That's people listening on Facebook because they don't want to be here or in a local church at all, to be completely honest. That means people who come only occasionally when there's not something more important to do or they're not too tired to come. Everyone must change. All of us must take this responsibility seriously. What greater responsibility do you have as a Christian than to show the world who Jesus is together? So individually, We've got to change, but also corporately. One of the things that's going to be happening in our church, you're going to hear about this tonight in the family meeting, you're going to hear about it a ton in March, is that we're going to put into our bylaws the way that we're already trying to actually function as a church. It's not necessarily that we're adding things. It's that we want to be clear. This is how we operate as a church. So if you want to become a member of this church, you've heard this for five years. You probably don't even realize it's not in the bylaws. All right? What we're doing is we're going to say, number one, we want you to come for a while. What we don't do is we don't get to the end of a church service and have people come up and just sign. Because I don't know you, and you don't know me. We are a bunch of crazy people. You need to know how crazy we are before you decide to sign on and be a part of us. All right? You might be a crazy person, which means you probably fit in great here. Right? But, but we want to know you, and we want to be known by you. We want to know what your spiritual gifts are so that we know when you become a member, there's where you go. Boom, right there. Right? So, so we watch for a while. And the second thing we do is you come to a new members class. And the reason you come to a new members class is because I don't want to assume that anybody knows what the gospel is. I want to tell you the gospel. I want you to hear the gospel. I don't want to know that you've responded to it. Then we do an application. Why? Because I want you to write out your testimony. It does not have to be elaborate. It does not have to be full of all the nine-syllable words you know. I want to know how you became a Christian. That's what I want to know. Why? Because the church is made up of Christians. Here's the problem. Sometimes it's not. But we want to be a church made up of Christians. And then we present because the church is responsible to vote on its members. You know, it's really important what you do when we, when we bring somebody up here at the beginning of a service, because we always introduce you at the beginning of a service, because you've been with us for months now. Like, 
my, the best thing I get to hear is people go, I already thought they were already a member. And they've been coming so long. Yes, exactly. We don't push membership because you're, you're already a part. We're affirming that. But you as a church are affirming that. That means you got to know these people. That means you got to get to know these people so that you can say as best as we know, that person is in Christ. Listen, sometimes we get it wrong because we are not the Holy Spirit. We want to be careful to know that when we are with the Lord, we can say, Lord, we stewarded your church well. We were careful about how we did that. The final thing that means, which is the hardest part of all of it, is we're going to have to ask some hard questions about what we do about an inactive membership role. And the reason that we have to do that is because I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. I see members but I don't see active members and inactive members because the Bible assumes that if you are a member, you are therefore active. Everything up here is activity, not passivity. Everything up here is the church declaring that a person is a part of the body and is in Christ. And so what we've got to contend with is so long as we have people who are declaring to be members of our church, but who are choosing to not actively be a part of our church, we don't know anything about their lives, but we, as a body of believers, are declaring that we believe that that person is not just in Christ, but is living like a Christian ought. And that's difficult, isn't it? It's dangerous. I could tell you a million stories of how that goes haywire real fast. So we got to be careful. And that's what all of this is about, is us thinking carefully. Because it comes back to those three sentences, right? The Bible is 100% true. If the Bible teaches it, we should do it. And if we're not doing it the way the Bible teaches it, then we should change. It's a constant call for us to change. Now, really quickly, I realize that there are a lot of people who haven't ever heard any of this, for whom this is all brand new. So I would be, I would be remiss to not stop for a moment and say, friends, this is what Christians do. We take the Bible seriously. We study the Bible carefully. We apply the Bible intentionally. And there's a real good chance that at least someone in here has been the victim of a mentality that says all you must do to be a Christian is to walk down at the end of a service and sign a card and get wet, and now nothing else is required of you. Friends, can I give you the words of Jesus? If any man should come after me, he should deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The sad reality that there are many who say they are Christians because they have gone through a process, but they've never humbled their lives to the saviors. And the words of Jesus are chilling. Listen to what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You know, we could take this same verse and apply it to what we're talking about today and it hit us real hard, right? Not everyone who says they are a member of a church will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. That day, many will say to me, Lord, wasn't our name on the membership roll? And didn't we sign a card and pray a prayer and try to be a good person? Then Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of lawlessness. Friends, knowing Christ is the goal. Knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection is the goal. And if you have lived your whole fakey Christian life never knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection, today if you will repent of your sins and believe in the gospel. You will be saved. You will get to experience the power of the gospel. That's our hope for you. All of this is so that we will be able to rightly declare who Christ is, so that the world will be able to rightly see who Christ is. If you've never been a Christian, if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to repent and believe today. It doesn't matter how long you've gone to church. Going to church does not make you a Christian anymore. And going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray.